we all have our own path to walk. It may be obstructed, it may be winding, and no doubt it will have peaks and valleys, but it is ours alone. Like onlookers at a marathon, friends and family can offer encouragement along the way, but ultimately we decide the trajectory that we take. In this series, Juliet Doris Williams offers a clear view from her path that may inform your decisions as you move toward finding your faith. One part spirituality, one part real world practicality, and a serious splash of fun. Here's Juliet. Hi, I'm Juliet, and welcome to Finding Faith. I'm the author of two books, one of which is Leaving Church, Finding Faith, Six Steps for Discovering Your Purpose in the World After Leaving the Christian Church, and the primary focus of this podcast. You can find both books and how to contact me on my website at julietdoriswilliams.com. I am here in this space chatting with you sometimes about the book, and sometimes about other things that may bubble up when we are talking about faith and life and how those two things intersect. Because if you are at all like me, they always intersect. Howdy there, Finding Faith friends. I've been on a short hiatus that turned into a long hiatus as I ruminated about what I wanted to do with this platform. Did I want to continue? Or did I want to quit? Do I still have things to say about my book? Which, by the way, this podcast has 34 episodes, counting this one, which is way more chapters than my book has. So clearly, I had lots more to say about faith and your purpose in the world once you depart from organized church. Way lots more to say. Then I pondered... Do I have anything to say about anything? And of course, I always have things to say. The question is, do I want to say them in this space? And are the are those things worth saying? Will my words add light, bring peace, and end suffering, or contribute to the noise? There's so much noise out there. So much discord in our public discourse. I can hardly tolerate talk radio, podcasts, audiobooks, anybody talking at me these days, no matter which political persuasion, I am weary of sound bites. The human experience is full of so much nuance, yet our collective experience keeps getting dumbed down from complexity by those whose jobs is to in who whose job is to interpret that life experience and then to to stratify that experience to to make it apply to well everyone one very irritating example of that is when politicians will make some pronouncement on something or other and then follow it up with that is what the american people want and for me it's if it's something i really do want i go well yeah even at that moment, I can also tell myself, I know for a fact that there are people who don't agree with me. Some people don't want the same thing that I want. There are people who, in fact, want the complete opposite of what I want. And both of us, me and those folks who don't agree with me, are all considered the American people, right? If we could all be so self-aware and less challenged by those who don't agree with us. What is it about the collective human experience that makes us intolerant of differences of opinion? As this is a faith-related type platform, we don't have to look far to note the various flavors of faith. So many flavors and textures and colors and types that we barely know what any of us are talking about when we say that we are people of faith. What does that even mean? Well, my friend, the answers are legion. I barely know a handful. There was a large portion, we were talking decades for me, um, of my life where being a person of faith meant one who believed in God, Jesus, his son, and the Holy Spirit. God was always masculine gendered then. It meant a person who belonged to and attended church regularly. It meant a person who read and studied the Bible devoutly. It meant a person who lived by a set of standards with the Ten Commandments as the foundation 
with a whole other set of rules tossed in, depending on which denomination I found myself in. The other set of rules is probably the source of the early cracks in my belief system. Some of, some of those rules dictated how one should dress, whether women should wear makeup, if 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 people should go to movies, if if uh, oh my gosh, playing cards, oh my, on and on. Some of those early cracks became caverns as I moved along my Christian journey. It's those other set of rules, by the way. Why, by the way, did you know there were 613 laws or rules in the book of Leviticus? The first 10 are the ones that we hear the most about. 613. But I digress. Another crack that became a cavern is my observation that all people who call themselves Christian didn't necessarily live strictly by those main 10 rules, not to mention many of the remaining 603. And then there was my career as a social worker, my first calling, as I've said here in this space, which brought relatively sheltered me into up close and personal contact with others who didn't look like me, believe or worship like me, live like me, love like me. And many, so many of them were lovely and loving humans. Yet many of the denominations I found myself in had issues with these lovely humans because the Bible said, occasionally they would say, because God said, I knew then that when people say that God says this or that, is wrong. It is because it was something in one of those 613 rules, cracks that became caverns. The biggest cavern that I never could and never have been able to overcome is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I have always only affiliated with the Christian church, so the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the single unifying thread throughout my whole church institution journey. This is the basis of the entire Christian belief system, allegedly. And the more I studied that life, the more I read those words attributed to him, the more I embraced and modeled my life on love, sacrifice, service, and forgiveness, the less and less I felt qualified to judge anyone else's life. I mean, the ultimate example of sacrificial love and universal acceptance and forgiveness was the prime directive for those who called themselves people of faith and believers in the way of Jesus, right? The way of Jesus was about healing the sick, raising the dead, welcoming the stranger and the outcast, inclusion rather than exclusion, speaking truth to power and refusing to condemn those that society had condemned. The way of Jesus was universal love and forgiveness for all the world, for all time, as the story goes. And because I so embraced the way, still do, by the way, it was really quite simple to ignore the cracks because the way of Jesus was a bridge over the caverns. I could look at each human I encountered through the lens of this is a human that God loves and does and is deserving of my consideration. And even if I could not love them, then I could commit to not harming them, which perfectly married together my social worker professional ethics code and my Jesus is the way code. That became and very much remains the foundation of my faith. I practiced my faith publicly as a devoutly participating member of the Christian church until I couldn't anymore. Not because I no longer believed and embraced the way of Jesus, but because the humans who interpreted what that meant did not see gifts in me that expressed what that way looked like, at least what in their minds it should look like for those licensed and ordained under their auspices. In many ways, I didn't leave the Christian church. It those I looked to as its leaders left me like a beggar on the side of the road, a beggar who was only asking to sit and stand with them to share more about this awesomely good news that God loves all of us 
and Jesus showed us the way to love each other. I talk about how devastated I was by that experience in my book. I also talk about how it how I felt held onto by that foundational faith in the one whose life was so inspirational for me. And life moved forward, not in the way I planned, but in a way that would put me even more up close and personal with those that God loves. Do I still believe in God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit? Yes. Why? Because for me, there have been too many personal experiences, unexplainable encounters that only makes sense to me if one believes in a power greater than oneself. Do I still think about those 613 rules? Not so much. Why? Because as it is written, the two most important rules, love God and love your neighbor as yourself, are the only two that we need be concerned with as that is the summation and the foundation of all the other rules. The problem, as I see it, is there are a whole bunch of folks who don't know how to love themselves, let alone love their neighbor, and are blinded by so much self-hate they can't even see God in themselves because they feel so unworthy. Self-hate is the force that perpetuates evil in the world. Juliet's theory, anyway. What is evil? Looking at your fellow human and not seeing before your very eyes the image of God. What is evil? Calling a thing or a person bad what God has called good. What is evil? Not feeding the hungry, not housing the homeless, not healing the sick, excluding those that God loves, not doing all in your power to make this world better for all of humanity, most importantly, not holding yourself accountable for and working on your own flaws and weaknesses. So my friend, in contrast, what is faith? Faith is whatever makes us more loving, more tolerant, more giving, more forgiving, more patient, more generous, first toward ourselves, then toward others. Can we acknowledge and forgive ourselves for being imperfect? Can we extend ourselves some grace? Because, and here's the important part, you can't give it to others unless you nurture it in yourself first. And guess what, friend? Nobody, no human on the face of the earth in this time or any other time was ever able to keep those 613 laws. This is the entire story of that, what is commonly referenced as the Old Testament, constant failure to keep and maintain those rules. This is why Jesus came in the first place, as the story goes, to remind us, you and me, that no thing, as in nothing, can separate us from the love of God. And if you don't or can't believe that, Take a deep breath and keep taking deep breaths and keep repeating to yourself, I am loved. I am worthy because God said so. You don't want to be calling God a liar now, do you? This is my faith, my friend. This is how I defined faith. I didn't create this. I just believe it. And I live it because I believe it. I've taken to saying that I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. But if sharing my truth makes life just a bit more bearable for someone else, I will gladly keep living my faith out loud, which means talking about it in this space. Thanks for visiting. That's all for now. Until next time, this is Finding Faith.